Good morning. Welcome to worship here at Peace. It's great to be with you here this morning. My name is Michael Kepke. I serve as a pastor over in Awatuki at Lamb of God Lutheran Church. And if you're wondering why I am here with you this morning, uh, Pastor Schrader and I are doing a swap today. So he is leading worship over at Lamb of God for me, uh, which gives me the privilege of leading you in worship here this morning. So it's great to be here. Today in worship, our theme is that the Christian trusts God to provide. Of course, it's easy to trust in God when everything is going well in your life, but it becomes much more difficult when the resources we have to work with are overshadowed by the needs or the lack that we are faced with, whether those needs are physical in nature or emotional or spiritual. And yet, even so, the Christian still focuses on God's promises. God has promised to care and provide for us in every area and in all circumstances of life. And so the Christian trusts God to provide even when we can't see exactly how he will do that. So you'll see that theme come through in our service this morning. We'll begin then with our opening hymn in your service folder, Precious Lord, Take My Hand. God bless your worship. I invite you to stand as you're able. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear friends, as we approach God, our holy God in worship, we must confess the sin that surrounds us, fills us, and separates us from him. We ask him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to forgive us. Lord of life, I confess that I am by nature dead in sin. For faithless worrying and selfish pride, for sins of habit and sins of choice, for the evil I have done and the good I have failed to do, you should cast me away from your presence forever. O oh Lord, I am sorry for my sins. Forgive me for Jesus' sake. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. In his great mercy, God made us alive in Christ even when we were dead in our sins. Hear the word of Christ through his called servant. I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
The Lord be with you. O oh God, you reveal your mighty power chiefly in showing mercy and kindness. Grant us the full measure of your grace, that we may obtain your promises and become partakers of your heavenly glory. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Please be seated now for the lessons. Our first lesson is from Isaiah chapter 55. Come, all you who are thirsty, come to the waters, and you who have no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why spend money on what is not bread, and your labor on what does not satisfy? Listen, listen to me, and eat what is good, and you will delight in the richest of fare. Give ear and come to me. Listen that you may live. I will make an everlasting covenant with you, my faithful love promised to David. See, I have made him a witness to the peoples, a ruler and commander of the peoples. Surely you will summon nations you know not, and nations you do not know will come running to you because of the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, for he has endowed you with splendor. That's our first lesson. Our second lesson comes from the book of 1 Timothy, chapter 4. For everything God created is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving, because it is consecrated by the word of God and prayer. This is the word of our Lord. We continue with the Apostles' Creed, and we speak this together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And at this time, I invite the kids to come forward. Great to see you guys up here this morning. How are you guys doing today? Good. Good. So I brought something along with me today. I brought my lunchbox. Any of you guys have a lunchbox at home? Yeah? What is your favorite thing to find in a lunchbox? Like if you wanted to open up your lunchbox and you're just thinking, oh man, this would be the best thing to find in there. What would that be? A treat. A treat. What? Candy. Oh yeah. Yeah. Good sugar stuff, right? Anyone else? Anyone else have some, some yummy stuff you'd like to find in a lunchbox? Turkey sandwiches. Hey, I'm with you on that. I love turkey sandwiches. Yeah, how about you? Chocolate. Oh, now you're talking my language. Love it. Very good. Well, I brought something along in my lunchbox today. Um, and are you excited to see what's in here? Let's take a look and see. Oh. What's in my lunchbox? Crackers. Oh, man. Just crackers. That's kind of disappointing, isn't it? Like when you're expecting something really good to be in your lunchbox, and then all you see is a few, few saltine crackers. Oh, man, that's kind of that's rough, isn't it? Well, this reminds me of a Bible story, though. Um, do you remember a Bible story that happened that kind of started off something like this, where there was just a few crackers and a lunchbox and, and a couple little fish? Do you, remember, do you remember a story like that? 
Jesus was, he was out on a, in, by the lake, and there were a lot of people there, and they were all really, really hungry, and a little boy gave Jesus his lunch, and you know what was inside that lunchbox? Just five little cracker-type things and two little fish, and that was supposed to feed, do you remember how many people that was supposed to feed? It was supposed to feed 5,000 people. Can you imagine that? Are there 5,000 people in here today? Not quite, huh? <laughs> that would be a lot of people. Do you think that's, that's possible? Could Jesus do that? Well, Jesus could, right? You remember what he did? So Jesus took the, the, the crackers and he took the fish and he broke them and he gave it to the people and he kept giving more and more and more and more until everybody, all those people had enough to eat and there was still 12 baskets left over at the end. Wow, that's pretty crazy, isn't it? And that helps us remember an important truth. Are, ever, are there ever times in your life when, when you worry about maybe not having enough or you worry, maybe you're a little scared of some things? that ever happened to you? Sometimes it happens to me. Maybe we, uh, we look in our, in our piggy bank, we don't see a whole lot there. Or you look in the refrigerator and you're not so sure what's, what's going to be in there. Or maybe you go to school and you're not sure if there's going to be people there that are going to be nice to you. Um, there's some things that we, we can worry about in our lives, right? Um, but this story reminds us that even if Jesus only has a little bit to work with, even if we just have a teeny tiny bit, is Jesus, is he power, strong enough to be able to give us everything we need, even if we don't think we have enough? Yeah, he is, right? Jesus is strong enough because that's, that's who he is. And we know Jesus is going to give us everything, he need, everything we need because he already gave us the most important thing, and that was when he died on the... To take away all of our so that we can go to? You guys got it. Awesome. So let's bow our heads and thank Jesus for that. Dear Jesus, thank you for giving us everything that we need. Help us to always trust you our whole lives. We love you, Jesus. Amen. Thanks, kids. You can go back to your seats.
We pray. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. In the name of our Savior Jesus, dear sisters and brothers. 35. According to the chart in my Bible, that's how many miracles Scripture records that Jesus performed during his ministry here on earth. That's quite a few, actually. Jesus' public ministry lasted about three to three and a half years, so if you do the math, it comes out to about one miracle per month. That's a pretty good pace. But then you also have various passages scattered throughout the Gospels, the books that record the life of Jesus, that say things like this. They say, Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness among the people. Wow. So it's clear that Jesus did a lot more miracles than 35. There were times that he went on a miracle spree, if you will, throwing them out in all directions, kind of like a firework on the 4th of July. And then there's the last verse of the last chapter of the last gospel that records the life of Jesus. After all four gospel writers have had a chance to record everything that the Holy Spirit directed them to record about Jesus' life, the highlights, you might say, John ends with this last verse. He says this, Jesus did many other things as well. If every one of them were written down, I suppose that even the whole world would not have room for the books that would be written. Wow. So we've got the 35 miracles that are specifically recounted for us, and who knows how many others that are just bunched together during Jesus' various miracle sprees. And then at the very end, we find out that the gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, have only scratched the surface of the things that Jesus did. So how many miracles did Jesus perform? Well, if you're a numbers person, I guess that's a question you'll have to wait until you get to heaven to find out. But for the rest of us, it's probably enough to know that Jesus did tons of them. But now, of all the miracles that Jesus performed, which one do you think is the most important? Take out the virgin birth and the resurrection. Okay, that's cheating. Those actually aren't included in the list of 35 that I mentioned earlier. But of the rest of them... Which is the most important? Well, one way you could go about answering that question would be to see which miracle gets the most press time in the Gospels. You're aware that sometimes the same miracle of Jesus will be recorded by more than one Gospel writer? So in the list that I have, 18 of the 35 miracles are recorded more than once. Of those 18 miracles, 11 are recorded by three out of the four gospel writers. So those must be pretty important if the Holy Spirit wants us to read them three separate times as we read through the life of Jesus, right? But of those 18 miracles that are recorded more than once, only one is recorded in all four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So if you're going by press time, that miracle is the most important of every miracle that Jesus performed. And friends, you're in luck because it's that very miracle that the Holy Spirit has set before us for our meditation this morning. So we read from Matthew chapter 14, verses 13 to 21. When Jesus heard what had happened, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. Hearing of this, the crowds followed him on foot from the towns. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them and healed their sick. As evening approached, the disciples came to him and said, This is a remote place, and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so they can go to the villages and buy themselves some food. Jesus replied, They do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. We have here only five loaves of bread and two fish, they answered. Bring them here to me, he said. And he directed the people to sit down on the grass. Taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. 
Then he gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the people. They all ate and were satisfied, and the disciples picked up twelve basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. The number of those who ate was about 5,000 men, besides women and children. Picture the scene. Jesus had been traveling around from town to town, preaching and teaching and healing and confronting his opponents, and now he was just plain tired. He needed a break. Add to that the fact that he had just found out that the ruler of the area he was working in, Herod, had just recently taken notice of everything that Jesus was doing. Herod had killed John the Baptist, the man whom God had sent to point people to Jesus. And Jesus knew that a time would come when he too would stand trial before that same Herod and ultimately go to his death. But now was not that time. Now was a time for Jesus to take a step back, get away from it all, and spend some time recharging his batteries with his disciples. So he takes his disciples, he jumps in a boat, and he heads across the northern corner of the Sea of Galilee to get away from all of the cities and the people. But when he lands, he's not greeted by the relaxing sounds of wind blowing through the trees or birds singing their songs. No, he's greeted by the very thing he was trying to get away from, people. Sick people who wanted him to do more healing and had followed him to his vacation spot. So Jesus jumps out of the boat and he says, what is with you people? Can't you see that I just need some quiet time to rest and relax? Go away. Give me a break. No, of course not. Even though he was dead tired, Jesus looked out at all of those people and his insides churned. Not with disgust at the next six person in line, but with compassion. The Greek word that is used there actually describes this inner feeling that you get in your gut when your stomach flips because you feel so strongly about something. In Jesus' case, it was this vast sea of human need that aroused that feeling. Is that how you feel when you look at big crowds of people? Do you wonder what is going on in their hearts and lives? Does your heart ache at the thought of all the human need and suffering that they're bearing? Do you pray for them to come to a knowledge of the Savior so that they can spend their eternity with him? Or do you wish that they'd all just get out of your way as you sit in traffic or stand in line or push through a crowd? Dear Jesus, change our hearts of stone, we must pray. And thank you for seeing our needs. So morning turns to noon, noon turns to afternoon, and pretty soon the sun begins its descent into the lake. The disciples look at the line of sick people, they glance at their watches, and they decide that Jesus better wrap things up. It's quitting time, Jesus, and all of these people need to eat soon. You better send them away quick while there's still time for them to get back to town and find something to eat. And I have to imagine that Jesus suppressed a little smirk when he turned to them and he said, Well, why don't you find something for them to eat? Uh, Jesus, you see that boy there with the five loaves and the two fish? That's about all we've got. Okay, Jesus says, bring them here to me. So he took the loaves and the fish, he looked up to heaven, and he gave thanks. And I wonder if the disciples even paid attention to the prayer, or if their minds were so fixated on the lack of food and how desperate the situation was getting that they didn't even hear it. Do you ever act like those disciples? Maybe it happens at the end of the month when the bills come in. You total them up and you compare it to the number in your checking account and your heart sinks. Maybe it happens when you look at your investments and you see them sinking like a rock in the lake and you fear that you'll never be able to retire or if you do, that you won't have enough to survive. Maybe it happens when catastrophe strikes, something really expensive breaks or a few things all at once and they need to get fixed but you have no idea where the money's going to come from. Or someone in your family gets sick or injured 
and you're not sure how you can go on without them if it comes to that. Or maybe it's some other situation in life where you look at your need, say for love or friendship, and then you look at the people in your life or the lack thereof, and you think, I'm just going to be sad forever. Or you look at the demands that your job or your family or simply everyday life places on you and you throw up your hands because you know that you're going to come up short. And so often, like the disciples, we forget who is standing right next to us. The one who at the beginning simply said, let there be, and there was. I wonder how long it took the disciples to catch on to what was actually happening here. Jesus breaks off a chunk of bread, he rips off a piece of the fish and hands it to Peter, say, Peter goes and he gives it to the first group of people sitting on the ground. Hope you're not that hungry, he thinks. Meanwhile, he watches the other disciples with their food, distributing it to some other groups. He goes back to Jesus, probably thinking that by now he'll be out, but he finds that there's still some left. And slowly, by the third or fourth trip, it starts to dawn on them what is actually happening. Jesus is doing it again. It's sort of like that magic trick where the magician keeps pulling handkerchiefs out of his sleeve. At first, you just think, well, he's got them tucked down his shirt, no big deal. But then he keeps pulling and pulling, and pretty soon you have a half mile worth of handkerchiefs, and you're thinking, where is all that coming from? It seems like this miracle happened kind of like that, gradually, not all at once. We're told that there were about 5,000 men in attendance. Add to that the women and the children, and you could be looking at a number between 15 and 20,000 people. Maybe you've been to the Footprint Center to catch a Suns game. That arena has a capacity of about 18,000 people. So imagine Jesus feeding a sold-out crowd at a Suns game using only five loaves and two fish. And no one goes home hungry, not even the teenage boys. You always wondered why there were 12 basketfuls left over, didn't you? Well, Jesus accounted for the teens who would be starving an hour later on the trip home. But isn't it amazing to think that there was more left over than Jesus had to begin with after all that? Aside from raising the dead, I can't think of another miracle Jesus did that displayed more power than this one. And maybe that's why it's the only miracle that is recorded by each of the four gospel writers. It made such an impression on each of them. They just couldn't tell Jesus' story without it. You know, there have been false teachers throughout the history of the world who have done miracles, not by God's power, but by Satan's. But none of them even come close to what Jesus did on this day. Shocking power. Which proves beyond the shadow of a doubt that Jesus is who he says he is. God himself wrapped in skin. No one else could have done anything close to this. And friends, that's the primary reason that Jesus did this miracle. First and foremost, it is to prove that he is God and therefore that his sacrifice on the cross is valuable enough to ransom you from every last one of your sins, no matter how many or how monstrous those sins might be. You are saved because it was more than a man who came to save you. God himself came to save you. And I hope that every time you read about one of Jesus' miracles, every time that you hear a sermon about one of Jesus' miracles, that you marvel at the fact that this is God himself. And that he came not just to do miracles, but to die for you. For your lack of love for others, for your lack of trust in him, so that he could spend his eternity with you. He loves you that much. But even though each miracle proves that Jesus is God, each miracle also has a unique message. So what's the unique message of this miracle? Well, to answer that, let's examine just briefly the way in which Jesus performed this miracle. 
You know, if I had been Jesus, I, I might have turned to the disciples and said, oh, you don't think there's enough food here? Watch this. And poof, I would have made a mountain of food appear. Or maybe I would have told the people to just hold out their hands and, and poof, the food would have materialized before their very eyes. That would have had a pretty dramatic effect, right? But Jesus didn't choose to do it that way. No, he chose to perform this miracle gradually, slowly. Little by little, he would break off some food and hand it to his disciples. Little by little, they would hand it out to the people. It may have always seemed like Jesus would run out the next minute, but he would always have more. And that was intentional because doing the miracle gradually accomplished two things. First, it kept the attention of the disciples and the people constantly on Jesus. If Jesus would have made the food magically materialize before their eyes, it wouldn't, they wouldn't have had to keep their focus on him. And second, it kept the people from putting their trust in the gift rather than in the giver. If Jesus would have made a mountain of food magically appear, no one would have had to trust Jesus to provide from that moment on. They could just trust in the mountain of food. But Jesus never allowed them to see the entire amount of food all at once. He was training them to trust that he would provide for their needs even when they couldn't see how. And that, I think, is the unique message of this miracle. You know when you look around and you don't have the slightest clue how your needs are going to be met physically or emotionally or mentally or relationally or otherwise, keep your eyes focused on Jesus. He knows exactly what you need to survive and he'll be sure to give it to you. Not everything you want, of course, but everything that you need. And he knows better than you exactly what that is. He created you, after all. But so often, he doesn't let you see it all at once. Because he wants to keep your eyes focused on him. He wants to build your trust in him to provide for all of your needs, even when you can't see how he's going to do it. He wants to keep you coming back to him. Not because he is somehow self-centered or controlling and, and wants to keep you under his thumb, but rather because in the end, he knows that he needs to keep you close to him and to his promises to keep your faith alive so that you can end up with him in heaven. His ultimate concern is for your eternity, and so, out of his great love for you, he wants to make sure that you always have a reason to keep coming back to him. And if you can understand that, then it completely reshapes the way that you look at the times of lack and need and failure and insufficiency that you experience in your life. None of us enjoys coming face to face with some lack or need in life that we don't know how it's going to be met. It makes us feel vulnerable and helpless. But to the mature Christian who has been trained by God's word, trained to view life through God's perspective and not our own, we can see those times not as God withholding a blessing from us, but as God actually giving a blessing to us. Maybe he knew that I was starting to feel a little too self-sufficient and he knew that attitude was going to make me feel like I didn't need him around in my life as much and that that was going to eventually weaken and maybe even kill my faith. Or maybe he simply had a plan to grow my faith bigger for my sake and for the sake of those around me. And so out of his love and grace, he gave me a blessing, gave me a reason to look to him and say, Lord Jesus, I have no idea how I'm going to meet this insurmountable need, how this gaping lack in my life is going to be supplied, how I'm going to overcome this failure or this catastrophe or this health issue with the five measly loaves and two little fish I have to work with. So Lord, if I'm going to make it through, if something good is going to happen here, you're going to have to take my little loaves and fish and do a miracle with them. You are going to have to provide me with what I could never provide for myself. And Lord, I expect you to do that. I know that you will do that, even if it's not in the way I expect, because that's just the kind of God you are. 
through Jesus, you have proven that you are a God who pours out your best blessings, forgiveness of every sin, and eternal life in heaven upon those who have nothing good to offer you, nothing with which to earn or deserve it in the least. And so I know that in this situation too, you will come through for me, even though you have so little to work with. And when you do, I will stand in awe of what you have done. Just like the disciples on that hillside stared in awe at the 12 basketfuls of food that were left over. I've been reading through the Psalms in my devotion time recently, and there was a psalm, a verse from Psalm 5 that really stuck out to me in this regard. The psalm writer David says this in verse 3 of Psalm 5. He says, In the morning, Lord, you hear my voice. In the morning, I lay my request before you and wait expectantly. Expectantly. In other words, David lays out his needs before God in the morning, and then he expects God to answer. He watches intently to see how God is going to meet those needs because he knows he will. Maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, maybe not in the way I think, but it will happen. God will provide what I need, and I'm interested to see how he's going to do that because based on what I can see, I don't have a clue how he will. So the next time you look at the needs and demands that are bearing down on you and the inventory of your resources turns up only about five loaves and two fish, remember who is standing next to you. There's no need to panic. He sees exactly what you have and he knows exactly what you need. And the only thing that exceeds his power to provide for you is his love that drove him to die for you. So just take your loaves and fish Put them in his hands and watch what he does next. God grant that for us all. Amen. And now the peace of God, which transcends all human understanding, may that guard your hearts and your minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. As we come before our Lord in prayer now, I invite you to please stand. O oh Lord our God, you are wise and powerful, good and gracious. Your mercies are new every morning. Each day you open your hand and provide for the needs of your children on earth. Strengthen your church and all the world. Let your comforting message of salvation in Christ Jesus be proclaimed to troubled souls everywhere. Bless our nation.
Bless our nation with capable leadership and government. Grant prosperity to our businesses and industries. Give employers a sense of fairness toward their workers and employees a feeling of joy and pride in their workmanship. Invigorate the schools of our land. Bless our students as they grow in their learning and in their appreciation of the many blessings you give us today and always. Strengthen our families. Give parents a renewed sense of commitment to watch over their children. Give children the wisdom to respect their elders. And Heavenly Father, giver of life and health, we ask that you would comfort Larry and Carol Dixon, as Larry will soon be starting treatment for cancer. Bless the efforts of the doctors and nurses, and give effectiveness to the medical means employed on his behalf. Grant Larry peace and confidence in your ever-abiding presence, and grant healing according to your will. Please also bless Carol as she supports Larry and encourages him with the news of Christ's love. And now also hear us, Lord, as we bring you our private petitions. We pray boldly as Jesus taught, with the confidence that you will hear us, and with the faith that you will bless us. And we join together in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated.
by your Holy Spirit to keep your word in pure hearts, that we may be strengthened in faith, guided in holiness, and comforted in life and in death. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you his peace. Amen. Thank you for being with us in God's house today. It's great to be able to gather together and encourage one another in faith. And I certainly appreciated the opportunity to be with you in worship here this morning. Pastor Schrader didn't give me anything specific to announce this morning, um, but does anyone else have anything that you know should be announced at this time? Speak now or forever hold your peace. <laughs> All right, seeing nothing else, may the Lord bless the rest of your week.